Okay. Um, so I, I mean, I, this is, uh, it's not a, a sort of lecture lecture in the sense that it doesn't reflect a, a kind of intensive body of research or work. It's something that was um, prompted by the, the kind of immediate circumstances that we're all in and that I um, proposed this as a kind of open-ended um, potentially series of talks or events um, or, you know, kind of impromptu symposium or something um, that would uh, reflect on some of the tendencies um, within the field of architecture um, from the perspective of the present, um, which is obviously a kind of unique one, um, but one which intersects in various ways, I think, with the concerns which we've all had um, for the past decade or so. Um, I thought maybe there could be a, a kind of brief um, preface, um, whoops, um, which is that uh, I actually only met Michael Sorkin um, once very briefly at a dinner, but I, there was a kind of anecdote of my experience of his work that I thought might be worth sharing and sort of sets um, a stage uh, for things. Um, I was waiting for somebody, I assume um, my now wife, um, who's perpetually late for things, um, in the Strand bookstore. Um, and I was there for like 30 or 45 minutes. This is probably like eight or nine years ago, right after I uh, graduated um, from graduate school, so working in New York. And I picked up The Exquisite Corpse off the shelf and was immediately um, Michael Sorkin's collection of essays and was immediately taken by the writing, which was um, lucid and uh, funny. And within a few pages, he'd completely excoriated the kind of boys club of New York uh, architecture, Philip Johnson and Paul Goldberger, and including my former professors at Yale, and, uh, many other people. And I, I thought, you know, it's a kind of um, model of uh, clarity and speaking plainly maybe about the circumstances we find ourselves in, not just in terms of uh, all of the kind of uh, craziness that's happening in the world, but also um, as architects thinking about the, our own practices and our own um, kind of positions and the, the discipline and the kind of power structures that we interact with. I think it's um, maybe a, a useful um, reminder that we should be, we should not uh, hold on to any illusions that we're in any less uh, precarious or difficult a position um, than many others in, in many cases. Um, also, uh, you know, just to say, not to be nostalgic about things, but um, it is a, a sort of uh, memory of a place like the Strand, which of course we can no longer uh, go to, but hopefully uh, comes back after um, all of this. Um, so, I mean, really this is um, sort of two thoughts conjoined. The first is that uh, it seems like in many ways, and these have been stated in many places, this current uh, crisis is a kind of accelerant of uh, tendencies that we recognize as having shaped uh, contemporary culture since uh, 2008 at least. And I, I would think of this crisis as potentially a kind of bracket um, to the period that I think speaking generally, generationally or sort of um, for the, the guests in this um, panel, um, has shaped all of our uh, entrances into the discipline and shaped the discipline more broadly. Um, and related to that has been, I think, the emergence in architecture um, of a kind of intensive uh, engagement with the idea of what I'm calling um, in this talk communal form, um, but more broadly attempts to uh, frame and produce uh, new forms of community and new forms of commons through architectural form, thinking about how architecture can actually give form to new social relations. Um, and social relations that obviously reflect um, the kind of particular circumstances that we've um, had since uh, the financial crisis, but you know, for a longer history, obviously, of late capitalism. Um, so if this crisis is, is a kind of accelerant, um, it seems to be bringing us almost instantly to things that we've been speculating about um, for a long time, you know, the digital mediation of all facets of our lives, extreme social isolation, precarious or non-existent employment, infringement of rights under the auspices of crisis management, the failure to produce or secure adequate housing um, for many, uh, the monopolization of services by large, large corporations, et cetera. And architecture, I think, has in many ways attempted to engage this uh, reality, which I think you know, this, this particular moment is um, revealing uh, acutely um, through its exploration of uh, new forms of communal dwelling uh, and uh, new sort of programmatic hybridizations of living and working um, that attempt to reframe those social relations in ways that are perhaps um, more utopian or more politically charged um, or more progressive in, in, in maybe a you know, more kind of casual uh, language. Um, 
and I think the, the present uh, crisis offers all of us an opportunity to sharpen the way in which we uh, position architecture in relation uh, to the, the broader world because uh, the world that comes after this will no doubt be uh, an even more extreme version of the one that we're in now and one which will uh, require um, architecture, I think, to be much more specific about the ways in which it can um, meaningfully uh, transform or uh, improve the conditions of those who are living in that world. Um, I think there's you know, interesting parallels, of course, um, to the period of the, the post-war period um, and the, the work of Team 10 and the metabolists and uh, the Italian radicals of the early 1970s and others who were similarly maybe negotiating, um, and here I'm talking about you know, architecture for the past decade or so, have been similarly negotiating or were similarly negotiating a kind of rapid oscillation between uh, the most dystopian and um, potentially utopian uh, outcomes between be, be, between uh, you know sort of extreme um, manifestations of uh, uh, I don't know how to say it. Well, I'll keep going, but um, just you know that th th there was a period in the post-war period marked by let's say. Um, both the promise of a new world and one of uh, rising levels of uh, rising living standards and, and new political programs and one that um, in many ways is the origins of, of many of the problems that we find ourselves confronting now, increasing inequality, uh, the gutting of social services at exactly the same moment um, that in other places new social services were being proposed, um, et cetera. Um, also, I think in this particular context, um, it's important to recognize the, the enormous influence that the work of um, OMA and others um, who've kind of descended from it have had on the field uh, it, for the past uh, generation or two, um, and which have sort of redirected a lot of the energy, I think, that was previously um, put towards uh, other more uh, explicitly formal or aesthetic um, ends towards something that engages much more robustly with um, program, and particularly with the idea of a kind of collective uh, typologies. Um, and then, of course, the, you know, the period since 2008 has been marked by any number of kind of intense and acute political um, conflicts, and many of those have been um, structured or, you know, sort of organized, um, in fact, in uh, very particular um, urban spaces or architectural spaces. And so I think the disciplines had a natural um, kind of relationship to that and desire to take on uh, the problem of actually framing those spaces in a much more intentional and specific way in relation to exactly those sorts of uh, political questions that movements like Occupy Wall Street or uh, the Arab Spring or Black Lives Matter, et cetera, have raised. Um, also to say that, you know, I think it, what one maybe um, note for those who aren't at the GSAP to, to understand is that at the school, the students, the, the first three semesters of the core or the course sequence of studios um, very much address uh, specifically the problem of um, the status of public space in the city of New York and the potential to organize new communities uh, around public space moving from uh, core one, which Anna, um, one of our panelists here coordinates um, in which the students uh, attempt to discover and um, reframe underutilized spaces within the city to core two in which the institutional building is reimagined as um, the sort of conventional institutional building, the school, uh, which is what we're doing this year or the library for the previous few years is reimagined as a kind of community hub. And then in core three, uh, in housing, which um, Adam, among others, um, teach, this is a project from the studio that I taught several years ago, um, in which the students are asked to rethink public housing in relation to new forms of public space and the new forms of public service that might um, attend public housing. Um, and I'm using the term communal form to distinguish it from uh, Fumihiko Maki's um, term collective form, which he used in the, in the 1960s and 70s. Um, to sort of organize a series of new speculations on large scale uh, uh, architectural slash urban investigations. Um, but of course his terms, I think would actually map on quite well. Um, his terms being uh, compositional form, mega form and group form, the three forms of collective form would map quite well onto any number of um, recent experiments. Um, and in this case, these are somewhat um, specifically chosen uh, Zago Architectures project from the 2016 American Pavilion at the the Venice Biennale, which was sought to um, speculate on the future of Detroit. And so you had 12 projects, which very explicitly took on the kind of reconstitution of the 20th century American city. Workday project um, 
from the 2012 foreclosed exhibition at MoMA in which you had um, five uh, practices taking on um, the American suburb in the aftermath of the financial crisis and the foreclosure crisis and um, the master plan of Tatiana Bilbao's um, or Tatiana Bilbao's master plan for the Territorio de Gigantes um, public housing project in Mexico, which is one of a number of very interesting um, new mass architecture and urbanistic or ar urban and architectural um, experiments to transform um, public housing in various places in Mexico, which a number of the faculty at the studio at the school, including once again Anna, have been um, involved in. Um, and you know, so I think the architecture, this kind of question of collective or communal form has been manifest in both the kind of banal um, ways in which architecture is a service profession that engages you know, the, the forces of real estate and commerce um, very directly in things like uh, WeWork, um, which of course we're probably all familiar with now, and the um, explosion of new models of co-working and co-living spaces that seek to, you know, to exploit a, a kind of class of precarious um, workers and, and startup uh, companies. Um, and then of course, and it's, and it's more familiar to those of us maybe in the ac academy's um, uh, attitude or uh, position as a kind of uh, form of critique as in the work of uh, dogma, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, which in, in many ways is programmatically not, uh, it's, it's like maybe typologically not dissimilar um, to WeWork in the sense that it, it, it tends to foster uh, a new form of collective uh, workspace, but one which is um, meant as a kind of critique of the, the exploitative tendencies of capitalism and instead um, meant to, to offer an alternative wherein there would be a kind of solidarity and security that comes from the intentional gathering of a community of laborers. Um, and we find the same thing, of course, in housing in you know, the, any number of uh, new co-living models with names like Common, the campus, the collective common space, and again, just to take an example from Dogham's work, the, the kind of counterposition of the um, critical model of uh, the kind of Fallon theory uh, of an intentional community of people who live and work together um, in some kind of state of exception uh, from the broader uh, city and marketplace. Um, and the, the work that um, has been done by you know, you know, many, including um, many in the faculty here at um, GSAF, um, has in many ways sought to challenge uh, norms around uh, domesticity and the dwelling, um, which I think, of course, we're all now confronting as we're confined to our uh, dwellings um, in ways that oscillate from, well, or as we could take as sort of two, two poles within this, the um, idea of the micro house um, as seen in an architect's Carmel Place project, which some of you may have um, seen in, in real life down in Phipps Bay. Um, in which the, the housing unit is reduced to its kind of essential functions of uh, kitchen, uh, bed, and uh, bathroom. And there is uh, meant to be a kind of trade-off um, both economically where more housing units can be produced and also um, collectively in which other spaces in the building um, can compensate for the lack of space within the apartment. Um, so there's a kind of a wider range of uh, communal spaces that are provided to the occupants of the building. Um, of course, these things run into the forces of uh, real estate development and, and don't always come to fruition as the architects might intend. Um, or in Anna's um, firm's pr project, 110 Rooms, 22 Dwellings in Barcelona, which probably fewer of you have seen in person, but which is also um, built, you have the opposite, I would say, kind of uh, end of the spectrum, which is the, the um, transformation of the dwelling into a series of generic rooms, which are then kind of infinitely reconfigurable. Uh, so as opposed to the architecture as machine idea of the micro unit, providing for the kind of basic functions. You have architecture as a kind of playing field um, into which many possibilities um, can be, or, or you know, in, in, within which many possibilities of, of kind of dwelling in various arrangements can be manifest. And in both cases, of course, there's a kind of um, attempt to position uh, that in relation to kind of larger uh, gestures towards the collective and, and the interface between the individual and the city in the form of uh, collective spaces on the lower levels. Um, and this is something that, you know, from our current perspective, it's hard to um, imagine that we'll approach the, the design of dwellings uh, the same again. Um, but certainly like in our own practice, it's been something that's been uh, a kind of obsession, which is to say, what is the, the nature of the kind of minimal um, dwelling? And what is it that, how does one define the limits of the, the kind of individuals 
um, experience in relation to the collective. And so this is pre iterations of a project uh, to develop a series of tiny houses, so-called tiny houses in Chicago, in which various configurations of the dwelling in relation to the, the kind of public space um, or the, the outdoor space are proposed, um, ranging from uh, a kind of conventional situation of uh, street facing uh, tiny houses with backyards um, to uh, a series of street facing houses sharing one large yard to uh, a series of individual units, each with their own individual yard, which of course we might now recognize as having a certain kind of value. Um, and uh, similarly, I would say uh, both attempting to propose new prototypes um, in terms of, uh, for instance, like speculating on a kind of approach to an infill lot, as well as starting to document the actual lived experience of, in, you know, particular because I'm here in New York, of uh, a New York apartment and starting to think about the ways in which uh, those apartments have particular features that we might uh, not recognize or um, be cognizant of when we are designing in, in a kind of blank slate fashion, um, but which might actually uh, suggest alternative uh, typologies. Um, uh, this is uh, taking a little longer than I thought, of course. Um, so I would just say, you know, I, I thought the, um, you know, this, in this kind of uh, open-ended uh, way that there's a series of themes or subjects which kind of emerge from the current, um, current situation that we might uh, structure a discussion around. And these wouldn't necessarily even be for this discussion, but there could be a sort of series of discussions that unfold from this, because I think I have some very specific questions for uh, the panelists. Um, but to say, one is that uh, much of this work on communal form or collective um, form has engaged a history of architectural types, which now find themselves in crisis. And of course, we can think back to Corbusier's fascination with the ocean liner and the social condenser, uh, of course, the panopticon and the prison, um, the college campus, uh, the cemetery, the hospital, uh, these uh, institutional types of the kind of 19th century um, that have done so much to shape architects' ideas of how a collective is actually structured in architectural form um, are, of course, now the sites of the most kind of acute crisis um, in, in, in this pandemic. Um, the second would be maybe a reconsideration of the discourse around health and architecture and uh, kind of revisiting of uh, various ideas of what the necessary uh, balance is between uh, outdoor space and, uh, and architecture um, from the kind of modernist vision of the city as uh, providing these, for these vast expanses of space which might be enjoyed um, by the occupants of the city, which now is, you know, New York, for instance, considers closing streets in order to provide more space for its residents. Um, we might think again about to something like the Smithson's diagram of the house of the future, in which they describe a vertical tube of unbreathed air, which is a you know, particularly apt phrase, maybe given current concerns um, at the center of that dwelling, uh, which is otherwise kind of opaque at its exterior, and which Beatrice Colomina actually uh, has written um, extensively about in, in an article um, called Unbreathed Air in 1956, which you should look up if you're interested in. Um, and of course, these things intersect in interesting ways with the kind of post-apocalyptic vision of the empty city, which has structured so much uh, contemporary fiction or uh, the kind of tendency towards the, the um, commune or, or the, the space uh, removed from the world um, and therefore protected and um, safe. Um, the, the idea that uh, we might reimagine um, the necessity of exterior space um, in, in ways which uh, echo again, of course, um, various uh, important experiments in, in uh, collective dwelling um, and uh, I'll, sorry, I'll, I'll keep going a little faster. And, you know, most sort of importantly is that I think in terms of uh, uh, the kind of longer term nature of American architecture is to confront the, the reality that it's like a fundamentally suburban um, country and actually architectures, um, architecture as it's developed in the United States, it's kind of primary theoretical contributions have been in the study of and imagination of kind of what we'd call suburban configurations, not urban ones. And there might be something uh, to be revisited in these, in the aftermath of a period in which we're all in ways being encouraged to live a uh, suburban lifestyle. Um, but I also wanna say that uh, I don't see this as a, as a kind of um, opportunity to, uh, in a very didactic way, address coronavirus through architecture, which I think architecture is not necessarily capable of doing in the sense that it's a very acute crisis which will pass. 
and we'll, which will leave um, in its wake uh, something else. Instead, to think about how we frame uh, the work of the past uh, decade um, from the perspective in which we recognize that the sort of stakes of that work have been um, highlighted and revealed in new ways, and uh, in which we recognize that work will be even more necessary um, in, in, in addressing the world um, to come. Um, so I, I was going to show some work from recent studios, but I think for the sake of um, time, I'll skip over it. But just to say that um, you know, this is something we've been working on at GSAP in studios I've been teaching um, for a number of years now in terms of uh, rethinking the potential of the, the kind of co commercial office building or the um, loft building as a type that could be reoccupied by new um, collectives uh, striving to live and work differently um, together. Um, and in one, I think, particularly apt way um, in relation to the panel here, this work intersects with, I think, a second characteristic of the kind of post-2008 discipline, which is what we might call the post-digital, um, I think for lack of a better term, I don't think that's a very good term, but a set of uh, aesthetic and working uh, aesthetic concerns and working methods that I think have characterized a generation's um, work. And we've been working through these um, techniques, the idea of architecture made of architecture, the idea of architecture as an aggregation of discrete objects. Um, and I think it, it bears uh, questioning how these aesthetic concerns and these ideas of producing architecture as a kind of collective form in the literal sense that the form is a collection of things um, relates to the problem of uh, producing architecture for the collective in the sense that architecture um, in some sense is meant to house and shape the social relations of a community. And I think these are the questions that um, the panelists um, clearly have been working on. We saw um, one of Anna's uh, housing projects earlier. This is Adam's um, project for a uh, uh, House for the Elderly in Brooklyn, which of course, you know, we can recognize as another kind of site of acute crisis right now. Um, Jimenez is uh, inside, outside, between, uh, beyond project, um, which was exhibited at SF MoMA, uh, which is a speculation on new urban typologies. Um, and, uh, you know, we might see it in, in sort of more detail in various, or in more color, in um, various projects by e each of the participants. Um, which seek to make uh, a kind of ensemble of a set of discrete parts. Um, and then, you know, lastly, I would say with respect to our position as architects and our own um, uh, the kind of precarity that's been revealed um, by this crisis in our own lives or in our, in our practice, you know, I don't, not to make it biographical, but, um, you know, more widely the way in which architecture, um, the practice of architecture has anticipated many of the kind of um, anxieties and uh, states of precarious existence um, that are currently uh, acute in terms of the collapse of life-work balance, the precarity of employment, the lack of access to benefits, et cetera. Um, we might think about how each of you has in a way taken on the practice of architecture itself um, as a subject in um, the production of the spaces in which you work or live or live and work um, together. So those are maybe two more um, specific questions um, for, for this, um, uh, group of young architects who I think um, represent a generation that has been concerned with these things and who themselves have um, specifically been concerned with these things. Um, and then I think there's a kind of broader set of questions um, that I hope were uh, perhaps uh, clearly uh, uh, articulated, uh, or not posed as questions, but sort of raised um, in terms of the ways in which um, the discipline more broadly has uh, devoted its energy or uh, as, substantial amount of its energy over the past 12 years to um, rethinking the kind of uh, collective um, as a uh, through architectural form or through, through architectural proposals um, and the way in which uh, that has attempted to address um, exactly the, the types of uh, conditions which are now uh, still exacerbated by this crisis and which maybe from the position of this crisis we are uh, can look at that work with new perspective and um, uh, again, sort of sharpen the ways in which we propose it or we pursue it in the future in relation um, to, to what is to come. Um, so uh, this, our panel here is uh, Jimenez Lai. I don't know what order everyone else is, they are in on everyone else's screen, but on my screen, we've got Jimenez Lai, uh, who's joining us from Los Angeles, uh, where he's the principal of Bureau Spectacular. Adam Frampton, who's joining us, I assume, from Brooklyn, probably not too far from me. Uh, where he's uh, principal of Only If, and Anna Pujaner, who I believe is in Barcelona, uh, normally somewhere between Barcelona and New York, 
um, who is the principal of Mayo. And I think all of them are in their home slash offices. So maybe that, that could be a place to start. I recognize Anna's from her website. So. Um, I don't know if you're all muted or not. So I mean, maybe one question. I think of you, all of you as a little bit, uh, you know, as a kind of micro generation ahead of me. But um, you know, one question is how, uh, if if we were to see 2008 as a kind of um, beginning and 2020 as maybe an end to a period in the discipline, how um, the 2008 financial crisis and its aftermath um, shaped your entry into the field and how. Um, the conditions which you recognize um, having sort of worked through uh, in the intervening 10 or 12 years or having been kind of uh, raised in the internet intervening 10 to 12 years um, are now sort of heightened in how you imagine moving forward uh, after this when we all presumably can go back to work. I'm just gonna say hello. Um, thanks, um, Emmett, for uh, this uh, provocative uh, set of questions and conversation. Uh, but I'm not gonna be the one to start, as uh, have been uh, intensely participated lately in these um, online talks. So I would uh, just uh, send my greetings to my colleagues and send them the word. I mean, Emmett, uh, yeah, and I uh, concur with uh, Anna's initial response. To, uh, it's really fan a, a fantastic presentation that you put together. Uh, and, you know, on a personal level, I find it um, somewhat healing, you know? Uh, we're, we're all undergoing a lot of anxieties and uh, moments of uh, uncertainty. So it's really great to uh, have a moment to be able to process where we're at right now. As far as your uh, kind of uh, kickoff question, uh, the initial question of how uh, each of us dealt with 2008, I think, you know, uh, I can't speak for the others, but at least from my point of view, uh, the three of us, uh, myself, Adam and Anna, represent three, I guess, paths of, of a kind of a fork in a row. Uh, as a matter of fact, Adam and I physically encountered the same fork in a row. Uh, we were both at OMA, uh, around 2007, 2008. Uh, I mean, 2007, we were both at OMA, but we, I think, took a slightly different path. Uh, he continued uh, at OMA in a very substantial way. And I sort of uh, took off and did something else. But I think other kinds of forks in the road, uh, if I were to kind of uh, think about Anna's path and my path, you know, uh, she decided to pursue a PhD around that point. Uh, so this type of uh, in, in immersion in the academy uh, took form that way. Um, and I think, you know, but what's maybe funny about this, these kinds of forks and roads all came back to GSAP, so. Um, yeah, thank you, Emmett, as well, for that, um, for, for the kind of presentation. I mean, I, we're all sort of told um, that at this moment, um, there's these kind of opportunity to sort of, you know, step back from everyday life and um, I don't know, think about things and do new things. And I've personally, I've found that's a struggle actually with all my, with all the extra time we now have at home. Um, it's somehow, um, it's harder to do more, but I, I'm very impressed how you've um, been kind of reflecting um, sort of on the moment that we find ourselves in right now. And you've clearly found the time um, to kind of do that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, the uh, 2000, 2009, 2008, um, you know, as Jimenez mentioned, like, um, I had actually graduated from school in 2006. Um, and so I felt like I kind of dodged the bullet on 2008, like I was, you know, established enough in a kind of office um, such that I could kind of stay there and I moved um, you know, to Hong Kong for four years after that, because Asia had been kind of less affected in a way by the financial crisis. And so I kind of weathered it. I don't think it would have been the same had I graduated. And I think my trajectory would have been very different. Um, uh, 
you know, I don't know, maybe for the better had I graduated in 2008, but um, different at least. Um, but I think the current, the current crisis, it's harder to, it, it seems harder that to maybe escape from it somehow. I think we'll all, I mean, both because of the severity of it, but um, also because I think it, it affects everywhere um, and everyone. Um, but, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I guess your, your presentation kind of offered maybe to, if I could kind of read into what you presented, kind of offered two different um, sort of forks, uh, as it were, like one might be that there's a kind of retrenchment um, and move against the kind of communal turn. I think when you alluded to kind of the new suburbanism um, in that maybe people would, you know, move into the kind of more individualistic modes and away and away from kind of cities, away from collectivity. Um, but I think like that, I, for me, it feels kind of like too early to make that um, conclusion or, I mean, I think we still need to kind of also understand how things play out with the pandemic now and the kind of, you know, suburban and rural territories. Like if it, it may seem that, you know, maybe in a way like um, the kind of community and support infrastructures that are enabled by the kind of collectivity and communality of cities actually allows allows us to kind of um, you know whether whether things more I mean I think we don't know we don't know yet and I guess there would I'm kind of curious in a way I don't it's not particularly my area of knowledge but others may know like in a way um, sort of looking at these kind of questions after past, after 1918, after kind of past pandemics. Um, I mean, I think in a very superficial way, one might say that the 19, 1920s and 1930s didn't, there was no, um, well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's a kind of open question, I guess, but, you know, how did, historically, like, how did these kind of events, you know, transform thinking about this kind of collectivity? And I, I think even on a very, maybe to kind of zoom in, something I've always wanted to do um, with, because you mentioned the sort of, the courses that we teach here at GSAP. Um, you know, I'm, I would be interested to take the kind of studio projects for the core three housing studio that um, I was one of several faculty teaching and look at the percentage of kind of collective or shared space in the projects. And I think if you, if you, if you measured everything and added everything up, I would guess that like 50% of our students' projects were under various terms, kind of collective or shared or um, et cetera. And that's always something we're kind of talking about and kind of questioning, let's say, um, that these kind of proportions um, in specifically in housing. And I would be interested to kind of do this exercise like, you know, last for this past year and then again for next year and also kind of in a way like measure or see how, you know, what, what the, what, what changes in a way. I think that would be, maybe also a way to kind of gauge the, the temperature of these sort of things too. Um, yeah, maybe one clarification or, or I, you know, I don't think, it's a strange position because on the one hand, I, I of course, and I think I said this to, to all of you in an email too, don't imagine that the useful thing to do is, um, is propose the kind of post coronavirus architecture in the sense that it seems like an acute problem, which of course touches architecture in many ways, because it touches everything, but which it would be short-sighted to imagine that uh, architecture is somehow going to address um, in the future. Um, but instead to think that um, this pandemic has precipitated an economic crisis, which seems likely to be as severe or more so than 2008, and has um, at least temporarily put us force us all to live in ways which we've been kind of speculating about or anxious about or anticipating at least since 2008 in terms of this sort of virtually mediated existence, this uh, weird um, mixture of sort of uh, like your homesteading materials are delivered to you by Amazon. You know, it would be preferable if it was an Amazon drone, not a worker. Uh, you know, that of course the, the labor economy is um, under enormous stress and so anxiety is about mass unemployment and automation and et cetera. You know, all these things are sort of brought to the fore. And so it seems like a, we're experiencing this weird sort of uh, time jump or like acceleration into a, a future that we have been anticipating and addressing obliquely or explicitly 
through work on these sort of collective projects. And so, and I, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but there's somehow it seems like an opportunity from this perspective, this kind of unexpected perspective to reevaluate that work and to um, imagine how we would pursue it on the other side. Um, because it seems like it'll be more necessary than ever. Um, and, and what's interesting to me about this, the American suburbs is more that I think it's a kind of fertile territory for um, possibilities in the future, both because there's so much of it and because um, so much of the kind of energy of American architecture in particular has been directed in one way or another towards its sort of production and theorization, but not to say we shall live in the most suburban, sort of conventionally suburban way, but rather that the it's full of other interesting contradictions or possibilities that can be brought to urban life and vice versa and, and can help to shape our idea of how we all live together or what, you know, within what forms we all live together. But if there's, you know, again, there's like something in this moment where we're all being asked to live. You know, if you had to travel, the best way to travel would be in a private car. And ideally you'd have a large backyard because you don't wanna be too close to anybody else. And the more space you had in your otherwise vast and inefficient house, the better, because now everybody is there all the time together. So you need all that space. So, you know, there's these funny sort of ironies of the fact that we've been resisting as a discipline or as a, you know, as a kind of, um, as producers of ar architecture, resisting these tendencies. And of course, on some level, we'd probably all be happy to have them at least temporarily. But, you know, there's also kind of interesting models where those things have been transposed into the city and we can imagine um, the potential to, to continue to think through that transposition as opposed to insisting uh, on a more kind of conventional idea of the city as a place purely of density and kind of minimal um, and, and the kind of minimum standard of architecture. I think we have to start um, understanding that uh, the actual uh, crisis as any other crisis, it doesn't, um, it mostly allows us to understand how how our society is defined. So most of the things that uh, are so um, there, so visible, were already happening before. And um, it's, um, let me put a, a case in order to understand it clearly, but um, precarious work was already there before. But now it's much more visible because precisely is that part of our society that is more is having more impact and it's the one that precisely cannot be confined. So actually, to be confined has become um, a sign of uh, of uh, social uh, prestige almost, and uh, has turned visible the the inequalities that. Uh, to exist in, in our society. And we can see that through the architecture as well. Um, and I'm saying this because um, we have to be careful about, you know, like uh, how we understand things and probably more than now, more than ever, we have to be really careful about how we use uh, the language, for instance, right? Like it's not about uh, social distancing. No, it's about physical distancing, which makes a, a total difference. So, and I'm saying this because obviously, um, you know, the capital system that we're living in always tend to neutralize and, um, and, and push us to put everything in the same basket in order to be, um, you know, more operative. And, uh, and I want to say this because uh, collective living or, or sharing or, you know, all these words that now almost uh, mean uh, capital interest, uh, they do have exist uh, for a long time, and the idea of collectivity uh, actually emerged uh, with the with the when uh, the idea of nation state emerged. Um, and so it's a long history that it actually can trace back. Uh, we could trace it back to the emerge of capitalism, but precisely, I would uh, in this case, which we are referring it to collective house. Um, we, we can trace it back to the 19th century when uh, most of the cities grow a lot and therefore there was uh, suddenly a need uh, 
uh, and all the AD or the collective spaces in relation with the domestic started to be argued and discussed. And it has been a conversation that started then and we have plenty of books about, you know, Monique Leff tracing, uh, tracing the, its origin uh, to obviously the closest one as Peri Aureli, but um, the theory and the thought about around um, sharing and the collective house has been always uh, there. It's true that in the last decades it has been capitalized one typology of, of collective house by the late capitalism, which is this uh, co-working, co-living spaces that Emmett was referring to. But again, I think that um, more than ever we have to be super careful and precise about not putting all collective uh, typologies on the same inside the same basket uh, because uh, we have to embrace diversity um, also as an answer to how our society is shifting is shifting we are uh, living behind um, uh, dichotomies we are living behind categories that used to be uh, strategic tools for precisely the, this uh, capitalism and late capitalism to emerge so how to transgress those uh, systems uh, for um, the benefit of the welfare um, um, society and probably I would say to start with, to be super cautious about uh, terminology and about um, how we um, understand things. But, I mean, uh, uh, go ahead. And I think uh, this point about uh, capitalism and the, uh, let's say, conflation or reductive reading of uh, what uh, these types of conditions of sharing is, uh, is super interesting. And I think it's really important to underscore um, I, and I think the kind of uh, economic pressures that, especially in a city like New York, uh, experiences is, is something that I, I want to maybe uh, unpack a little bit. Uh, and I, I want to come back to this this idea of the let's say nuances of uh, speculations, you know, or at least nuances of speculative pursuits. Um, and and I also want to use this kind of opportunity to address uh, a previous uh, train of thought. You know, are, are we? Uh, obviously, we're not doing a post virus architecture right now in this discussion. I, I think to me, the point, maybe at least from my understanding of Emmett's uh, description, the point seems to be more about uh, is there a way for us to retro retroactively speculate a, a type of mode of practice uh, that could become, you know, a, a, a momentum toward, towards the future uh, rather than, you know, like specifically what form, what shape, what, you know, uh, ide ide ideologies, you know. So, Let's just, I, I want to come back to the early 1980s uh, as a point of departure uh, of, of saying something. But then before I say something about the early 1980s, I want to say something about, um, well, I want to make a statement, which is every um, speculative practice uh, seemed to respond to disasters. Uh, or, or maybe saying, saying it slightly differently, well, maybe every single disaster I can think of uh, spawn something uh, uh, pretty, pretty pretty radical. Um, so, for example, you know, um, it wasn't. It took a flood in the 1960s uh, for Florentine architects, you know, Archizome and uh, Super Studio, to get together and say enough, enough with modernism, enough with you know, uh, training Italian young Italians to believe that we're here to build architecture when we can't really, when we can't, we're supposed to preserve it. You know, where we can um, even look back to uh, moments where when a com total com complete collapse of the, uh, I guess the Great Depression, you know, the international style um, exhibition was 1932, right? Like it was, I think the timing of some of these uh, pretty important moments seem to correspond with uh, major disasters. And I would say my practice us practice, Adam's practice, uh, all has something to do with the previous one, which is 2008, right? Uh, and if, if that's a train of thought that we're trying to unpack here, are there modalities from which, uh, you know, disaster, we respond to disasters by inventively <laughs> reframing practices? Uh, I, I want to come again, come back to the early 1980s. Uh, and once, I want to, I mean, late 70s, early 80s, I guess, you know, there was a mild recession at the time. Uh, and there was also, I guess, the oil crisis, uh, Missile crisis, the Cold War. I think things were happening then. Um, but I want to point at um, 
one uh, direction, which is the uh, pamphlet architecture, storefront for art and architecture, uh, all of that happened around that, right? Uh, that, that is a type of, let's say, applied idealism where uh, a group of people were just basically saying, well, we're not gonna get jobs anyway, you know, who cares, let's do something interesting. Uh, let's let's fully apply our idealisms. You know, I think that's what that was uh, a, a type of you know incredibly speculative thinking about since architecture cannot be real, let's do something unreal. You know, but then I want to come back to the 19 early because because uh, early 1980s because uh, you're touching on uh, suburbanism as a site, uh, and there was uh, something that happened then too, which is new urbanism. Uh, so in the 1980s, if I were to identify a type of fork in a row where people didn't respond to a disaster, uh, didn't, didn't respond to, you know, uh, what are the contextual, the cultural context around them, uh, one type said, uh, well, let's do something hopefully stupid. Another said, well, let's do something hopefully applicable, uh, which is new urbanism. And they, they came out very differently, right? And so, I mean, a case in point, a kind of economic pressure that may have pushed one direction versus another, uh, but the eventual economic pressure did push the Stephen Halls of the world to have a practice, uh, but based on a kind of initial uh, uh, prepared manifesto moment uh, that was uh, presented to him because of a, a mild crisis that he had to deal with, you know. Uh, but then you, the, you, the, the different type of uh, manifesto that was uh, put forth by the new, new urbanism played out very differently. Uh, I don't know, you can tell us your opinion, I can tell you that my opinion is not, not extremely favorable uh, about new urbanism. But I just want to, you know, say, uh, conclude this train of thought by saying, I think there's an economic pressure, uh, especially uh, in New York City, that's not just triggered by the coronavirus. It's been brewing in the background for at least 10, 15, if not 20 years, uh, you know, I'm, I had I had a Canadian education, uh, you know, my my tuition, my debt, my relationship with debt is not insane. I think I can't speak for Anna, but I can I only speculate that a European education also does not leave her walking around with an invisible house on her back. Uh, and you know, most Princetonians I know uh, also uh, were lucky enough to uh, have a different kind of economic pressure around them. So this this idea of you know uh, forget forget about it, let's just be idealistic is not possible. Uh, it's not possible, uh, in, in especially at a place like GSAD in, in, in a city, city like New York. Uh, and so I just want to you know see if uh, people would respond to this idea of the the ideal, fully ideal or the ideal practical, uh, because you know what else are you supposed to do? You're supposed to <clears throat> eat. It was such a moment of optimism there, Jimenez, in your train of thought until we got to the end of that train of thought. <laughs> but I, I do think it's important. I don't know if I have a um, an answer to that, but I do think it's important to have, like Anna kind of been on, like all of you have been on Zoom a lot. And I think there's always the the question of like how to see the the, the potentials out of the current crisis, despite all the sort of challenges that we're facing right now and I you know I think there are um, yeah that's I guess the potentials of like how our kind of society and system might change afterwards but also what Jimenez was kind of alluding to like professionally how do we change and how do we kind of how will our own you know practices um, adjust or you know be more entrepreneurial or you know reflect the fact that the new situation we're moving in so um yeah i don't know i like <laughs> i i like this idea that um well it, it could go the same way in the 80s towards a kind of more you know visionary and um speculative <laughs> kind of mode but yeah um it's maybe for those of us that have the kind of privilege or fortune to do that too well it seems like yeah i mean there's a uh, an intersection between the ambitions in the studios we teach and in the practices we hope to build and in the you know writing we do or research we do to address the broader collective uh, through architecture and to, to propose new forms of living together or you know new new ways of um, supporting 
community or building community. And then there's the, oftentimes it seems absence of that within, the, within our own discipline. And it seems like this crisis is gonna precipitate a need for that uh, because without it, not all of us, I mean, maybe, I don't know about the four of us, but many people won't be in the field at the end of it potentially, um, which, uh, or, you know, our positions um, in many cases, or the students who are, you know, graduating will be uh, extremely precarious. And so it does seem like there's an opportunity to think about how we um, build a kind of collective uh, or organizational power within the discipline, which for various historical reasons um, or cultural reasons, maybe hasn't been very good at doing that. At the same time that, of course, we imagine how we can serve the broader uh, collectives or communities um, of the world outside of the field of architecture, or, or just to recognize that we're part of those and we're not, we don't occupy any particularly special status. Let me be, let me throw a positive also message um, as <laughs> Mine probably was a little bit dark before, um, um, and uh, and maybe recalling uh, what Emmett pointed out about the 2008 crisis. That is true that all of us we came out from there, and precisely even if before I was uh, saying that there's not um, a before and after. By that I meant that I. Um, uh, the crisis as the one that we're living in just unveil uh, social structures or uh, problematics that were already there. But it's through that, through this um, um, act of unveiling, through suddenly the fact that um, most of things that uh, probably were there but not that much uh, visible, uh, we, in a, an easier manner, we can have a critical reaction to that. And, uh, and and precisely, we, or I love to think that we start the office with that aim since the beginning. It was not the best time to open an architectural office in Spain when there was nothing to build. And precisely, uh, the only needs that we had at the time, it was to stop building. So, um, so I think that first demands to uh, understand the discipline in a wide uh, sense. Um, so as an answer, I think that you can never uh, step out of the field as soon as you have entered it, because uh, architecture is a is a type of knowledge. As soon as you have, as you as soon as you have it, um, it it's really difficult to step out, and uh, it's a permanent learning, and that uh, demands us to know how to answer to certain things. And on another positive note. And before also I, I recall the welfare state it, in the United States, we have to remember, I, sorry that I'm kind of quoting really old things and from the old past, but it's important to know um, why we are here and how do we live uh, tracing back to centuries. And uh, this uh, scenario that we're living in is not just because of the last crisis, it's because of a lot of uh, historical changes that emerge. And uh, it's important to understand that the welfare state in the United States started after, in the 30s, after the 1929. So it was a consequence, a reaction to the huge crisis of 29 that suddenly the government started to um, include policies that would assure the welfare of citizens mildly in the 30s and it's still quite limited nowadays in the United States. So these moments of crisis, for instance, can allow um, to shift uh, social structures. Um, and it's precisely a good moment to uh, produce architecture of resistance that can, uh, or uh, by that I mean uh, physically and physically in all ways, um, in all formats, that try to answer precisely to those realities that, uh, that, uh, that we think that they should uh, change. Lila, I don't, so, I don't know if you're still here. I don't know if we have a... Opinions. I feel like that's where Lila can really shine. Um, <laughs> hold so on a second, guys. I need to... Hi, guys. Sorry. Um, I just want to check on time. I know it's two o'clock, but... So yeah, I mean... starting. 
there have not been any drops in the number of participants in the call. So I think um, folks are still engaged and interested. So if you'd like to continue the conversation, no questions have come in from the chat. So if uh, there's any um, guests on the call who are interested in participating in the discussion, feel free to um, go ahead and submit your kind of questions now. But um, if you'd like to um, wrap up with final thoughts while we wait for questions, you're welcome to do that as well, guys, um, as the panel. Okay, so yeah, I mean, I thought uh, we probably shouldn't go too much longer because I, I at least have um, studio this afternoon. Um, but maybe to Anna's point, I mean, I think it gets to, to what I, and I, I don't think this is a fair question uh, for you or a kind of uh, reasonable uh, forum in which to fully explore it, given that we have like 30 minutes on Zoom. Uh, but, you know, exactly, it, it's exactly the impulse towards a kind of radical or critical architecture um, that I think this particular moment offers us the opportunity to evaluate and sort of sharpen in preparation for its need in, in the future. I mean, right now, if we're sort of on pause, we can imagine that, that what's to come will be uh, extreme and that if there is to be a useful, critical, or radical function for architecture in that context, it will have to have learned from its previous iterations, whether it's the 1980s or the 1970s or the 2010, the, I don't know what are the 2010s, the 2010s. Um, you know, each of these, each, each crisis, as Simonez points out, uh, brings with it a kind of new, um, new modes of architectural thinking and representation and new ambitions um, for the discipline. And so um, given that we've all in one way or another attempted to propose alternatives uh, over the past 10 years. Uh, and I think it's interesting, you know, to him and as his forks in the road, I mean, Anna, I think you've undertaken a, a kind of uh, long historical investigation of the, the kind of collective dwelling um, through the framework of the kitchenless um, city. I mean, Adam, I think about the, your work on Hong Kong and the ways in which, uh, you know, kind of unfettered commerce, I suppose, an intersection with some kind of uh, urban planning can produce a, and, and sort of urban constraints can produce a, a radically different form of public space in the form of the, the kind of interconnection of Hong Kong's uh, central core. And him and as, of, of course, through like narrative and other um, forms of speculation, I think have attempted to find kind of corners to work in, whether it's like the corner of your own office to build yourself a house or whether it's the, um, you know, the, the kind of cartoon or other things which might um, traditionally have fallen outside of the, the kind of discipline as mediums to work in. But I mean, maybe the, the, that as a reframed as a question, like if you each had a thought on, perhaps it's not fair to say like what um, we could do or like how the, you know, what the critique should be, but rather to start to think about how the, in, in what medium or through what techniques the critique might be made. And this might also be an opportunity to reflect on our sort of Zoom existence, you know, which is our current medium of, of, uh, of necessity, I guess. Um, because each of you have uh, attempted, you know, beyond plans and sections or proposals for clients or competitions to construct a kind of uh, discourse or a way of uh, representing and articulating ideas, um, which now you might have some, have had some time to reflect on I don't mean even in this exact minute, but you know this kind of historical minute, but over the past, over the, the first third or you know quarter or whatever it is of your career, um, and from this position might have some um, insight into how to to kind of uh, transform or continue um, moving into the future. I don't know if that, that makes sense as a question. Yeah, that I mean that's also actually a discussion that um, we're having now in my um, in my. GSAP studio, like, um, you know, how does the, since everything is on the screen and everything is over Zoom now, how do we, um, you know, how do, how do the, how does the, mo how do the modes of representation shift and how do we kind of communicate our work? And that's, you know, the current and hopefully somewhat temporary, somewhat persistent situation of the screen. But then I think beyond that, the, you know, the world in which, and the economy in which the students graduate into. And I think it's too early to draw 
any conclusions, but I think there's, um, on the one hand, like nobody can build models anymore, which is sad and disappointing. But on the other hand, you know, they're also thinking about how other, other modes, um, you know, building websites or, you know, ways in which they can kind of, you know, prepare their manifestos that actually might even not only suit the current moment, but suit the, the, you know, the profession as it exists in a year or two in the future when, you know, we may not be, maybe more important to kind of communicate to people outside of the profession too. I mean, it, it could go both ways, I would say, but, um, you know, I would say that from, at least from my students, there's a feeling like, how do we now change what we're doing to kind of speak to an audience, a broader audience as well. So um, in, in terms of representation, that's one, one thought. Um, I, I think <clears throat> so, um, you know, um, how to move forward, I think this question um, may be answered by, uh, you know, what will your answer be when the moment in which uh, the question comes to you, what more can you lose? You know, I think in 2008, I faced that question, uh, what more can I lose? Uh, or, and the, or the converse, conversely, the opposite flip side of that question is, uh, what's their possibly to be gained, you know? Uh, and so the, this, this feeling of what more can I lose uh, was uh, in some ways really liberating, you know? I think if we were to brush it with a, 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 a tinge of optimism, you know, uh, it was liberating to, to encounter the moment of what more can, can I lose? Um, I remember, you know, about a year ago, I had a chance to, you know, I had a chance to uh, sit down with Yona Friedman. Uh, Yona Friedman passed away recently. But, uh, you know, I was doing an interview with him. We just, you know, he couldn't really hear. So we, we had to communicate via the medium of uh, drawing, doodling, and writing. So we just sat across each other. Basically, you know, I had so many pretty, let's say, sophisticated questions. You know, I wanted to know whether or not uh, Eve Klein's work, uh, coming from a, a similarly per Parisian context, whether or not Eve Klein's, you know, uh, air architecture has something to do with uh, the way that he eventually uh, produced a spatial city, or whether or not, you know, the residues of the found objects uh, so that, that started by uh, Marcel Duchamp had something. But uh, he just kind of cut through all of this. He just cut through all of it by saying, well, I survived the Holocaust. Uh, when I left the camp, um, I just had pants and shoes. That's all I had. <laughs> And so this question of, you know, what more can I lose? What more can one lose? Uh, I think it's, it's a sobering moment. Uh, it's difficult, obviously. It's, you know, a scary, super scary. Uh, because, you know, we're, we're about to face it again. And I don't, I don't know, you know, over the course of one's lifetime, how many times can you endure this question of, you know, how more, what more can you lose? But I, I think, you know, I, I, I want to spend this... Uh, question of what more can, what can I lose uh, uh, to this question that Yona Kutsky is asking in the comment session, text section. I'm just going to read out loud her question. You mentioned, I mean, I think she's mentioned, uh, referring to Anna. You mentioned how policies that influence the current state of welfare were reactionary. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on my theory that depending on the pol political climate and agenda of a place, the architecture will reflect or be representative rather of that political thinking, economics and social order will follow suit. I'm interested in exploring how architecture in turn can influence politics. I think that's a really, really great question. I, I think that's the, at least from, from my end, a, a place I'd like to end on is, you know, um, I think uh, uh, idealism can influence uh, policy. Uh, and I think the representation of idealism uh, has so much more power uh, down the line uh, than uh, the shackles of bureaucracy. Uh, and I, I think, you know, uh, so the subscription of idealism, I think uh, at, a, at a moment in which, you know, you might encounter the question, what more can I lose? Uh, I, I just want to leave uh, on, a, on a note like that, uh, that I think, uh, you know, if you can uh, find the strength within yourself to, ex to exercise your idealism, uh, I think there, there might be hope yet. Let me follow up um, also answering to a question that um, 
that Zina brought up, um, and it's kind of related. Um, she uh, mentioned she was uh, actually, um, let me uh, re read. She says, if we diverge to using the notion physical distancing instead of social distancing, we are redefining what social means, and that is this virtual connection is socially acceptable. Tying back to what I said on, on another talk, this fourth industrial revolution is making us rethink the way we live, connect and behave, but it should not in any case disconnect us from the essence of human connections. We can see how the new generation is already suffering from social anxieties and disconnections as they have been brought up with conscious access to social media and digital platforms. I think that um, coming back to, to the idea of uh, social um, disconnection um, and online and, and the online reality, uh, the digital world that we're living in, it has its good and bad points, as Jimenez was pointing out before. I, I think uh, it's just a tool. Obviously, the anxiety that we are suffering uh, these days, uh, it's uh, attached to the, it's uh, related to the fact that uh, media is uh, bombarding us with uh, uh, the actual emergency and, uh, among other things, uh, it's um, more than ever visible, uh, the cyber control. Cyber control of bodies because we cannot move, but cyber control to the point that uh, some of us, we are even being tracked by governments. So we are seeing uh, the bad uh, side of the coin of the digital world that we're living in. Um, so let me correct, uh, obviously physical uh, distancing and um, it doesn't um, I, I didn't meant that uh, that uh, that online uh, so socializing is actually uh, the only good tool. Uh, social uh, online uh, relations don't deny other type of relations, and they should not deny. A question from Jonah here. I think you're on mute, Emma. Do we want to answer this last, or answer, uh, discuss the last question, and then maybe we um, wrap up for today? Great. This is from Jenna Rowan, now a doctor of architecture, I believe. Uh, I, I can read it. Recognizing that there's a transience to the current crisis, there is a particular spatial aspect of it that may persist, isolation, separation from each other. When this passes, do architects have any social responsibility to confront the acceleration of that tendency? Uh, for example, making places worth visiting. I mean, uh, John, congratulations uh, on becoming a doctor. Uh, I think the short answer is obviously yes. Short answer is obviously yes, but I think uh, clearly, you know, um, I, I feel like there's maybe even an opportunity to think about the flip side of uh, your question, which is, which is probably right. You know, this might persist. People uh, might uh, become more comfortable uh, with the idea of where they are, uh, and you know, the let's say specificities specificities of the qualities of the domestic interior might change too, uh, given that they, people might spend more time at home. So I, in a way, uh, optimistically, the architect, architect, the quality of architecture might advance both in terms of the public, because now we have to get people to go out and the private, because people will spend more time doctoring up their own homes. Yeah, I think that, I mean, I, I was trying to get at that in the presentation, which is that I think, and this is the sort of the suburban aspect of it, which is that maybe this prompts us to reconsider what architecture worth living in actually is and to expand somewhat our idea of what we're comfortable proposing as the kind of minimum dwelling or whether the, the kind of minimum dwelling is the right attitude uh, towards the problem of producing a you know a place for somebody to live in um, because we recognize obviously already many of us are living and working and performing childcare and recreating and doing any number of other things in uh, 
limited space. And this uh, current crisis allows us to recognize that or allows maybe everybody to share in that reality, which is a reality for many people already. Uh, and so maybe our shared experience of what it means for all of life to be kind of collapsed into a few hundred square feet um, prompt some reconsideration of what uh, those few hundred square feet uh, should be or whether a few hundred square feet is enough. Mm. I mean, it's interesting we all answered, we're answering the question in terms of the kind of domestic realm. And I think that's, it's kind of telling, of course, it's because we're all locked in our, you know, couple hundred square feet apartments, or many of we may be locked in our apartments. But I think it's also because all of us, in a way, have this interest in housing in our practices, right, which is maybe one way in which our, our trajectories were inflected by 2008. Um, but I mean, I do, you started Emmett with Michael Sorkin, and I think maybe also kind of um, coming back to the city is important and seeing the kind of potential of the current crisis in the city is important, not the house. And I think that we do, you know, one kind of positive is like, I think the way in which we see the city right now without cars on the streets. Um, you know, you mentioned the ideal way to get away would be in a car, but actually the bicycle is kind of quite an important mode right now, at least in New York City. Um, for me personally, I think we see the city, you know, with less pollution, we see, um, and we see the value of like the kind of exterior spaces that we have in our, um, you know, in our in houses, like anecdotally, like I'm, you know, my apartment is 500 square feet, but I have a kind of outdoor balcony, which I see, you know, and indeed kind of recognize the value of more and more when we're kind of cooped up here. So I think the, um, you know, I, um, I, I do agree with Jonah's, um, you know, kind of question or, or point. Um, but I think it's not only like, after the kind of current moment, it's maybe also seeing what within the current moment too, right? It's, uh, I, I would say that it's super interesting these days. Um, also again, with a positive note here, um, Common, um, these days um, more than ever, uh, or more than often than uh, usual, media is filled with uh, articles and talks about uh, architecture. At least in Barcelona and in Spain, like the TV shows uh, how good, uh, how to improve your home during quarantine. And uh, uh, they're asking architects to talk online and uh, on the radio conversations about how uh, should we improve in the future, not on, only our healthcare uh, spaces and infrastructures and, and, relate, and relating them to possibilities of uh, resilience, how they could grow and decrease for future epidemics, etc. But also how our homes have been able to adapt to the actual situation and turn visible the reality uh, for most of our houses in Spain that they're not that well designed. So how to improve that in terms of quality of light and, and uh, you know, the possibility to have a little bit of an outdoor space, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So I yeah, like at the end, probably uh, Jimenez uh, is right. We are all uh, from the same generation that we are a little bit uh, idealistic and uh, and maybe in, uh, at the end of the day, uh, deeply optimistic. And that's why we could survive to a crisis. So that would be the first uh, appeal to take <laughs> a lot, lot of optimism. Uh, but it's true that might um, all these conversations that are uh, already uh, on the media due to the actual uh, quarantine uh, situation might affect to the values of, of how spaces and uh, cities are defined. 